Good evening, everyone. <laughs> um, hello, for those of you in the audience and online, hopefully. My name is Brenda defoe Supernot. I am the senior planner with the city of Cape Canaveral. I've been working on this project with Kim Lee Horn. And very briefly, I just want to recap that we're here to look at the Presidential Streets Network. Um, this is the second uh, community workshop on this subject. And Kim Lee Horn is going to present. They have a lot of information to present. So I'm going to leave it there. Um, there is going to be an interactive portion to this with a QR code. So that will be your opportunity to kind of give any additional feedback. But we're going to save all of our comments. Um, this isn't the forum to kind of have that, that back and forth. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Kelly and Colleen from Kim Lee Horn. Thank you. Thanks, Brenda. And uh, thanks to uh, Dave and, of course, uh, the city manager, Todd Morley. Uh, I know we have an elected official here. I'm not going to call him out by name because I don't remember his name. But uh, <laughs> I know. Uh, but I do appreciate everybody being here. And hopefully those that are joining us uh, from the con from confines of their house, you're going to be able to participate as part of tonight's discussion as well. Uh, but before we begin, I just want to introduce uh, Colleen McGue, who's an integral part of our team. Uh, Colleen, as well as Mike Votto, who is actually sitting behind the control board. He's helping us control the online version of this. Uh, our couple of key members of the team, I think the last workshop that we had uh, over at the library and the community room over there, where we had about 60 people uh, plus that showed up, there was also a young lady by the name of Monet Moore. Uh, Monet couldn't make it tonight, unfortunately. So, uh, like I said, Colleen, who has like I said, been here as part of the project, is with us tonight. And we're going to lead the discussion as far as kind of what the initial findings were, some of the results from the workshop itself, as well as things to consider. Now, this isn't going to just be Kelly and Colleen talking for two hours. That gets really boring. So there's going to be some interaction and some activities that we're going to have for you. And there again, if you're here with us live versus uh, online, everybody has an opportunity to participate. And Colleen's actually going to kind of explain what we're doing and how we do it. So, Colleen. All right. Thank you very much. So hopefully many of you have one of these in your pocket or on your person. Um, what you're going to do right now so that you can participate in that interactive um, polling so that we can have both the, the hybrid online and in-person participation in that. Take out your smartphone and get, get open up your camera. Hover over um, the QR code that's on the screen and you'll see a little link show up that says attend.si. Tap on that yellow box, that little yellow link, and that will take you um, to the site where you'll be able to enter your information, log in, and view the, the presentation online and participate in the poll as well. If you need some help, let me know. I can come around and of the QR code. Yes. We just updated it. But it looks like we have seven attendees right now wow. participating. So um, once yeah, once you're comfortable, give me a look and uh all right, thank you, Doc. <laughs> If you need to stand yeah. up to get closer to the screen, by all means, please do so. We've got a Zoom. Great. Want we to want to make sure everybody's able to participate. Yes, sir. You want the hand up? Are you having some technical issues? No? You good? All right, great. Oh, awesome. Yeah, looks like we're up to nine. So I think that's good enough to get started. Perfect. And you'll be able to download the slides after our presentation directly from that link. It'll send it to your um, email address if you put that in there. And don't worry, you will not get spam calls about your car warranty uh, or anything else from this. Um, if you do, I promise it's not me. I'm the technologically inept person. It's these two. Uh, Colleen, I'll let you kind of. <laughs> We're going to start off with a fun question. All right. So, just to get everybody warmed up, make sure it's working. How did you get here today? So, in about a few seconds, it should start. It take we have a delay. So, uh, you should have some options popping up on your screen. Mike, if you could show the poll so that we can see. There we go. So we're seeing how everyone's responding. 
wow, we had some people who walked here. That's great. Most of us drove. I drove. We carpooled. We so carpooled. Oh, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Someone dropped me off. All right. So great. the great thing about these questions, and like I said, there's a series of these all throughout the evening. Um, most of them are set for 30 seconds, so you got to be kind of quick with your thumbs. If we see that you're having some challenges, just raise your hand, and we can extend the time out for, for another 30 seconds to give everybody a minute. Uh, we can't keep it open longer than that. Otherwise, like I said, it, it starts to kind of degrade the question. So. We wanted to kind of go through a couple of things and just kind of talk about and give you a very brief overview because I know some of the faces I see here are familiar. Uh, those that I can't see online, I'm hoping are familiar as well. But for those of you who were not able to make our last community workshop, we just want to give you an idea of what we talked about and what we discussed and some of the results that came out of that, uh, when I say very interactive discussion that we had, we even had, uh, I'll say a, a member of the community as old, or excuse me, as young as 10 months old participating, uh, which was probably one of the first that I've had. Um, but, you know, we had a very, I mean, very broad range of comments and recommendations and thoughts and questions. And I know Todd and I spoke with a lot of folks and there was a lot of really great input. And, and one of the things that showed us, especially on our team, is that the community cares. There's a lot that's going on in this community there's a lot of actions that the city has taken to try to make sure that, you know, Cape Canaveral is the best place to be, period. And, you know, it's not just doing a lot of studies. It's not just asking a lot of questions. You look around and look at the changes that have been occurring, things that the city has initiated, the things that the city has, uh, you know, partnered with, and that it's all over the city itself. And, you know, what was the city like 10 years ago? What was the city like 20 years ago? Even how, what was the city like five years ago compared to today? And then what's it gonna be like in another five years? So as Todd likes to say, you know, this, this discussion that we're having on the presidential street, which is that core area of the city, that historic neighborhood uh, that is, is Cape Canaveral, and you know, kind of is that heartbeat of the city, you know, what, what do we wanna see happen within that? And both in the short term, and as Todd likes to say, that generational aspect. And that's not just five years from now, it's not 10 years from now, we're talking 20, 30, 40 years from now, because we wanna be able to show what we're doing now and take that to the next level. So just a kind of a quick overview and an introduction. Uh, so what we did uh, early on when we were talking with the city was to say, you know, what, what do we want to do? We want to, basically, we say we want to create a roadmap. We want to give the city a blueprint that says, here's some things to think about as you continue that growth that you're doing and that vision and those proactive steps. We're going to provide some a, a, a series of broad-based ideas and thoughts that the city council can come back to every year and say, we like this idea. We found additional funding. We've got money to do, to do this. And this becomes kind of this, this incremental improvement that we're talking about. So the city hired us, and we've been partnering with the city for a number of years, and we really enjoy this relationship uh, because it is a very forward-thinking community. But you know, what the thing is, is it's not just developing a plan that's gonna sit on the shelf. This is something that we want to be a part of for not only myself, Colleen, and the folks that we have in our office so they can continue to come here and go, I worked on that, I helped out with that. And you know that starts to be really critical uh, as we're moving through this. So presidential streets is kind of that, what are we thinking about? And the other thing to think about is it's more than just the neighborhood itself. There's so much interaction going on between A1A and North Atlantic all the way to the beach ends and the Atlantic itself. You know, what's going on at the port all the way down to the city of Cocoa. But more importantly, what is that, there again, that core area that we're talking about. So. Where are we talking about specifically, Mike? Uh, it is, maybe, maybe, there we go. Uh, so like I said, just like it says, you know, we're going just above uh, Washington, Sherry, down the, the park and the school that's uh, up on the north, all the way down to Johnson. Uh, of course, we go from uh, the beach ends, and technically we go all the way from the Atlantic over to North Atlantic Avenue uh, and you know, so th that portion of the area of the city itself. So when you start looking at this, you may start to say, well, how, what are we talking about here? And it's just like it says on the screen, it's about 256 acres. 
and there's in, within that are is about 2800 residents there's a lot of people that are living here in the city and what's even more impressive is what we're going to talk about in just a second with the online survey that we did but you know the city we all sat together and said okay this is a pretty large area what can we do to start to focus in on some of the key assets that the city has so we said okay well, let's let's look at a focus area you know, it's a really technical term, but we said, let's take a, a deeper dive in a core area that's, you know, kind of centered with City Hall here and extending over to the beach. That encompasses about 75 acres. So you can see we've kind of narrowed down the vision and the view, and that takes into consideration Harrison down to Pierce. So that kind of targeted core area. And there again, so the thing is, looking at the presidential streets as a whole, but really trying to focus in on that core area and what is what's, what are the impacts that we have there. Now, what was really interesting is that second bullet that you see there, within this area are 13 miles of roadways. That's phenomenal. I know Colleen has worked for some pretty dense and, and urbanized cities as have I. I'm not sure if I've seen that much roadway network within this confines of an area. So there's a lot going on. There's a lot of connectivity. Uh, this is the things that planners dream of, this, this grid network. Uh, and, but we're gonna talk about some potential ideas and thoughts as we move forward. So we did a series of items as part of the, 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 the workshop. And Mike, if you can go to the, there we go. There was an online survey. We had a series of exercises. Uh, we had, like I said, quite a bit of, of interest uh, and information that was provided. And what was really interesting is, you know, we did sit down with the city staff. We've been talking with them. We've been talking with other stakeholders. We went back as far as when, you know, we, we first started working on uh, the community redevelopment plan, which believe it or not, Todd, is 10 years old already. Seems like only yesterday, 10 years. And look what's been accomplished in that 10 year period. Very, very impressive. So we took all of that information, we synthesized it, we met with the community, we started asking them the same similar types of questions, but in a more personal manner going, what do you want to see as a resident, as an owner? What would make this, this, this city even better? So, you know, we had the community workshop, we've reviewed the plans, we did our independent research. You know, we've been working with the city there again for over 10 years. We've got multiple folks that are working from the stormwater, the utilities, as well as the planning side. So we've been polling all those folks and those resources, and some of the recommendations that we've developed across the board, we're gonna be rolling out tonight and giving you all a, a, a portion of this meeting to actually say, great, Kelly, Colleen, and Mike, you've given us this, let's refine it a little bit more. And that's where some of the interaction is going to come about. Now we'll tell you that this is not the last time that you're going to see us, uh, Zach, there's Zach, uh, Zach and I were talking about this earlier. We're going to sit down on Thursday. We're gonna be talking about the next rollout. And when I say that, that is the presentation of the full master plan post tonight's input to the planning and zoning board, as well as to the city council. So there's gonna be opportunities for the city and interested persons to provide those comments, even after tonight. And as Todd will tell you, as Dave Dickey, uh, good, a good close personal friend of ours uh, and the development director for the city will tell you, this is a very interactive process. We wanna hear comments. We wanna see that information because this is your city, period. So with that, Mike, uh, just a little bit more about the community engagement. Uh, this is a little bit about what we, what we saw, what we did uh, back on February the 23rd. Like I said, a really good turnout, some great information. And what we saw at the end of the night, you know, we started talking about some of those broad-based topics for recommendations that when you start thinking about how does, how does this map out, what were the kind of the core things that we saw based off of the community workshop? And as you can see by these really cool diagrams that are kind of hard to read, unfortunately, um, we got an increase in font size on that. That's okay. I got old eyes. Um, you know, a couple of things, a couple of themes kept coming about. And it wasn't just one area or one topic or one activity that said this, but safety was a big item. And there was multiple ways that we can talk about safety. The shade trees and streetscape, looking at that. And then we started looking at what are the priorities that we saw from the various uh, exercises. And you know, a lot of people were concerned about the flooding. You know, you live in a coastal area. It's going to drain, but it, 
also is going to have some standing water from time to time. But we know we've got to work on something like that. But, you know, perception is reality. Reality is perception. So if, if folks are saying that flooding is an issue, we have to take it seriously and then start to look at where are those areas and what, what do we need to be looking at? Safer intersections and then also the sidewalks. So you can see on that right-hand side that those broad-based topics that we were looking at, we gave the opportunity and we didn't, we didn't sit there and say, oh, you really should be looking at safety. We just said, which, which one is most important to you across different activities? And this is the way that those items kind of ranked out. The online survey that we did, uh, hopefully a lot of folks in this room were able to do that. And we're gonna zoom in on this in just a second, but all of those dots that you see on that map are comments. Comments that individuals left for us, whether it was uh, with respect to flooding, it was a point of interest com comment, a project idea, which we got a lot of those, which is great. Uh, areas where they like to see shade trees, uh, safety concerns, but then the ever popular, the red dot, anything else. Now, what's really, really interesting is when you start to kind of look at that overall map and, and the larger study area is in blue and it, it, we'll, we'll zoom in on the focus area in just a second, the majority of respondents had comments within that core focus area. So we knew pretty close, we got that right from a focus component. Now, the one thing I will also say as part of this is there are no wrong answers. I will say there's one that's probably a little less right than some of the other ones, the one that's out in the Atlantic. Uh, and I'm trying to remember, was that in relation to sea level rise or, uh, but no, I always like to make a joke, but the fact that somebody took the time, they may have just geographically missed it, not a big deal, but they took the time. Um, what was really interesting is out of that online survey, we had 640 responses. 640 individual responses. That wasn't somebody going in there 10 times and hitting the same response, because it actually kicks those out. So 640 individual responses were provided. And what were those comparisons and what were those markers identified as? Safety, shade trees, de and creating destinations, and all the way down to flooding. The, the, the anything else was kind of that catch all. What do you want to talk about? What did we miss or what did you want to add on to that? All of the comments that we received, all the mapping information, all of this is actually going to into that finalized report as part of the appendix to help create that, that record so that the city council knows moving forward, this was important and why. And it's not just Kimley Horn saying, well, we got this, but we kind of pushed it off to the side. To the contrary, we're not editing comments. We're not summarizing comments. These are your comments in your own written words. So turn it back over to Colleen. Great, thank you. So we've got another little poll coming up. I know a couple new people walked in. So Mike, if we're able to go back to that first slide so that they can join via the QR code, um, just a reminder, you're gonna take out your phone, use your phone camera and zoom in on that QR code and that will allow you to participate in the interactive online poll if you'd like. Okay. Um, so let's make sure everybody, let's wake everyone up again. You've, you've heard a lot of about why, how we got here and, and what we've looked at so far. So um, what is your favorite thing about the presidential streets? And now you'll have the chance to type in an answer. You've got a little bit of extra time on this one, so you can think and type. Oh yeah, beach access. Mm -hmm. That's your favorite. Neighborhoods. There we go. We're starting to see some, some action. Trees, access to the beach and city amenities, walkability. Too late? We can open it back up. Mike, Mike is in control. He's got the power. All right, we got a little more time. <laughs> Shouldn't be. No, there's, it looks like some additional things have popped. No sm small town feeling, no high rises, homey, roots legacy. That's great. 
Sorry, they're so small. Not busy. Please. No hotels. Yeah, no hotels. <laughs> okay. Great. That helps us feel what that sense of place is here, um, which we've heard a lot about, certainly. Um, comes across. All right, is that enough time for everyone? We're good? All right, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Yes, it should have. Um, did you notice that it, your information is up here, whatever you typed in, are you seeing it? Let me read them all again, since they're so tiny. Um, small town feeling, no high rises, homey, roots, legacy, trees, no hotels, slow speeds, neighbors talking, beach access, trees, walkability, not busy, quiet neighborhoods, quick access to the beach and city amenities, walkability, and beach access. You had more? Oh. It timed out and so you didn't get it all in. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. We'll, we'll leave them open a little bit longer. If you need more time next time, just give me a look. Hit the submit after, once you start seeing the question, and that'll get it in in time. We're leaving them open for about 40 seconds. So you got to be quick. I know. <laughs> All right. We'll try and incorporate it in. All of this is, is um, coming to us on the back end, too, so we'll be able to download the report after this. All right. Thank you. So at this point, oh, there it goes. It's all populated in there. Next one. So at this point, we're going to start talking about the broad-based recommendations based on what we heard um, and all the, the, the great things Kelly talked about. We came up with eight different um, broad-based recommendations for the presidential streets area that you see up here. Pedestrian slash bicycle improvements, roadway improvements, intersection and crossing improvements, placemaking design improvements, traffic calming tools, beach ends with a focus on accessibility and parking, stormwater improvements, and resiliency improvements. And so I'll start by focusing on the um, pedestrian and bicycle improvements. Um, this map shows safety hotspots in the area where we've seen vehicle crashes, bicycle crashes, and um, pedestrian crashes in the area. Um, so we developed a series of um, pedestrian and bicycle improvement recommendations, um, more specifically. Next slide. There we go. Um, and you know, starting out with sidewalks. And on on the right, you'll see that we kind of came up with like almost like a Yelp review version of how much this is going to cost. You know, from one dollar sign to two dollar signs. So you can get a sense of what we're talking about um, in terms of each of these improvements. Some of them are uh, more costly, certainly, but you know, sidewalks are going to promote and improve neighborhood connectivity, promote recreation and active transportation. Uh, Multi-use trail, we're talking about a shared path where bicyclists and pedestrians could ride on it. It's a wider type of a sidewalk facility. Pedestrian scale lighting. Um, this is something that uh, we noticed is, is an issue in this area, making sure that everything is, is well lit since pedestrian fatalities tend to occur during those low light conditions. Um, shared lane markings. That if you might have heard the term share rows. Um, it's a painting, painted marking in the roadway uh, that shows bicyclists could be in the roadway. Kind of draws your attention to that as a motorist or as a bicyclist. And then a bicycle boulevard, one of the more expensive things, um, but that is like a, a two-way bicycle path that might be painted green. So the next one, we've got another poll for you. Given that the presidential streets have 
limited space. One of our constraints in this area is um, you know, limited city-owned right-of-way. So we can recommend a lot of different options, um, but in the end, it's gonna come down to choices and what's most important to the community in that space that's available. And so you should be able to see um, some options wide sidewalks or multi-use trail um, on one side of the street or sidewalks, um, narrower sidewalks on both sides of the street and um, potentially those shared lane markings for bicycles in the roadway. Where it looks like we have a little typo in there. Or um, bicycle lanes, four foot each in the street, but no sidewalk. All right, we need more time, Mike. He's got it. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, so we've extended more time. Looks like we had some more votes pop in there. Um, what wide sidewalk looks like it's winning the day here so far with bicycle lanes coming in. I loved watching it change live as different people vote. Yeah, well, it just, it, you know, with this few people, it actually swings it quite a bit. Everyone have a chance to vote? Great, okay. Looks like we can close it now, Mike. Thank you. All right, so I'm gonna turn it back over to, is it, am I talking about roadway? All right, I'm still going. Still going, talking about roadway improvements, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna go a little more quickly through these because I think you guys probably know um, what we're talking about when we're talking about roadway improvements. Um, Repaving the roadway, which some of your streets definitely need, you know, looking at the condition of them and the cracks and, um, you know, the resurfacing schedule. Um, this can be more on the more expensive side, but um, this should also be combined with some of the other improvements we're talking about. So you can kind of combine um, multiple things and get more bang for the buck here. Restriping the roadway markings, very inexpensive, and that is something easy that, um, that we can do. Reduced speed limit, um, that's also an option, um, but it really should come along with some of these other recommendations because you can tell people to drive a different speed, but unless we start changing the street a little bit, they're still gonna drive the same speed. Um, and then looking at all-way stops. So I know you guys live here, you know, we have some kind of inconsistent stop sign placement throughout the study area. So doing a more thorough stop sign evaluation and making sure that those stop signs are where they should be and maybe seeing if traffic patterns have shifted enough that we can have additional stop signs out there. Uh, next one is intersection and crossing improvements. And um, we, have, we have a lot of different options here. First of all, making sure all of your um, curb ramps that you have out there are ADA compliant. That's gonna be really important um, to make sure your community is accessible to everyone. That can be um, less expensive or more expensive, depends on how many of them we're doing, certainly. Um, high emphasis crosswalk, you see an example of that on here, drawing, people's attention to the fact that there's a lot of pedestrians crossing at this location. Um, usually this is in the middle of a block, not necessarily at, at an intersection. Um, a curb extension or a bulb out, this is visually and physically narrowing the roadway down um, to create a safer and shorter crossing for a pedestrian. Um, and it also increases the available space for street furniture and plantings which is something that we heard a lot about when we see shade trees. Um, rectangular rapid flashing beacon, this is a type of treatment where you press a button and then the, um, there you can see that yield sign up there saying a pedestrian's gonna cross in, in a flashing light. That's physically activated by the person crossing the street. Mid-block crossings. Um, in roadway lighting, that can be also synced up with a crosswalk improvement. So a pedestrian presses the button, and then this is great when you have a lot of people crossing somewhere in the dark. And so that roadway actually lights up and draws the attention to the fact that somebody's in that crosswalk and gives the vehicle a chance to slow down and stop. And then of course, standard signage, uh, making sure that all your signs are up to date. And um, that's one of the more inexpensive things you can do. Next, placemaking design improvements. Um, 
I love these. And, and from the sounds of it, you all are really interested in this too, wayfinding. Um, so when I'm talking about wayfinding, you know, providing residents and visitors directions to get to certain districts and destinations. You have a lot of key destinations in the presidential streets area. This also really encourages walking and bicycling. Uh, street furniture, really improving the comfort and appearance of the sidewalk, giving people a place to rest when they're walking around. Um, it can include things from, as, such as benches, um, public art, bicycle racks. You guys already have some really fun ones um, in your community that really you know, give you a sense of place and where you are. Um, public art, I already mentioned that. Even newspaper kiosks or trash receptacles, planter boxes, that type of thing. Um, painted intersections and painted crosswalks. We're talking about adding like murals and artwork um, into the actual roadway. Um, you know, it really beautifies the roadway. You can choose a design that fits with your community. I saw some beautiful murals on our way in today. Um, you know, it also naturally slows vehicle speeds um, and draws attention of motorists, the fact that there might be pedestrian activity there. Um, shade and street trees. This one is, is kind of a, um, an easy one, doesn't require much explanation, but consideration of an adopt a tree program or some type of program where we're encouraging property owners to have a tree on their own property um, to help provide some of that shade in the right of way where we have that limited space. And so that gives, make sure the city has space to put in sidewalks or multi-use paths and then also those paths will be shaded by some of these lovely trees. Um, and then green infrastructure, there's many different kinds. These can be installed throughout the community to provide uh, benefits to both humans and the natural environment. Help some of that rainwater that you get um, here percolate down into the groundwater instead of standing there and um, contributing to that nuisance flooding. Um, rainwater gardens, et cetera, permeable pavement, um, those kinds of things. Turn it over to Kelly. So when we start talking about traffic calming, it's one of those very, very broad-based topics. And, and actually, a lot of what Colleen was just talking about with some of the roadway improvements, as well as the intersection, the crossing improvements, and even some of the placemaking design improvements are also kind of wrapped up into some of the traffic calming tools. Now, traffic calming in itself is not just one specific item. It is a variety of things, it's like going to a buffet and being able to say, I want a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And what we try to identify and, and put out there for folks is to, to say that even along an entire length of street, we'll say poinsettia as an example, you could have multiple iterations of the traffic calming tools, depending on what, what section of the roadway you're in. Whether it's just implementing an overall, we'll say neighborhood traffic calming program, which was, is actually very quick and easy because what you do is, is start to take the information we're doing here and expand it out to where specific streets or specific areas of, this, of, of the neighborhood can help prioritize with city council where and what types of traffic calming they'd like to do. That's pretty quick and easy. But what we start to look at implementing are those pedestrian safety islands. And, and actually Colleen had an image of one similar to that, but what we're talking about is, you know, on those longer uh, runs where we have to walk across like Ridgewood or something like that, or even going across North Atlantic, the, the longer, the larger streets, we're providing a, a, a midpoint along that route for people to be able to stop, especially if traffic is moving, give you a little bit of a break and also get you out of the flow of traffic uh, within some points. Pinch points, so physically making the roadways a little, a little more narrow, not taking away the travel lanes, but even just the appearance where you start to kind of bring the curb in a little bit, uh, where on street parking may start to be proposed, just that visual image starts to slow down uh, folks. Chicanes, just like it sounds, we start on one side of the road, we move to the other side, and we're forcing traffic to alternate uh, in those areas. It's, it's very similar to if, you're, if you ever watch uh, Formula One racing, you'll see the chicanes on that. Uh, sorry, I said they watched uh, the Miami Grand Prix this past weekend. Love watching that. Uh, curb radii reduction, so making the curbs a little tighter. Raised intersections. This is, no, this is usually one that's not so much of a fun uh, public safety, but
but uh, it is a traffic calming device where we take the entire intersection, raise it up and elevate it, almost like a, what we call, you know, the traffic table or the speed humps to where there is that not only visual, but also a constructed improvement that slows traffic down. Neighborhood traffic circles, speed feedback signs. Have you seen those great signs that start to flash at you when you go 31 and a 30? Uh, those are definitely attention getters. They will slow you down and they're, they're actually uh, not that expensive. Even something as simple as on-street parking and then like you see on the, t uh, the, the images here, that speed hump or the speed table. There again, just something that will start to physically slow cars down. It's not just the physical, but it's also that psychological. So we do have a question for you, so get your phones ready. Ready, Mike? So, if you had money, don't start it yet, Mike. Let me get through my little spiel. Give everybody a few moments to think about this one. So, what would you like to see from a traffic calming perspective based off of those items that we were just talking about, whether it's the safety islands, the pinch points, the chicanes, uh, the raised intersections, the traffic circles, or any of those uh, features. So Mike, you ready? Here we go. Ooh, we got some variety here. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you want to go back? Give it just a little bit more. I will tell you, we did look at a couple of those in different portions of the city just to see if we could make one fit. Yeah. I'm surprised curb radii reduction is up there with the uh, the feedback signs. That's usually, you know, people don't like the tight turns. Uh, but this is actually really interesting. This is a little different uh, breakout than what we typically see with this one. So interesting. So let's let's move on to the next topic. This is, like I said, one of the ones I know is extremely important to the city. Um, There we are, the beach ends, accessibility and the parking. Now, how many beach ends do you have along the presidential streets? 16. Okay, pretty much any street that goes to that side has a beach end. That's your access. That's why everybody comes here, to, to go to that beach. Now, what's different, but different between here and Coco, of course, is well, how, what, what, what do we pay for parking here? It's okay, Cocoa Beach. So Cocoa Beach, you pay. Here you don't. There's a premium on parking, to say the least. So we, we know that just even driving around this evening, we see cars that are parked on the street. We can pretty much assume where they're headed or where they are right now, which is at the beach. So one of the things that we started to look at and start to throw out there as part of, part of this uh, plan is, how can we improve the accessibility to the beach? And similar to what Colleen was talking about, we know we've got some actual ADA accessibility things we, we probably should work on uh, so that the beaches can be enjoyed by everyone, but also can we increase the parking? Can we increase or improve the, the parking flows around there? So when we started looking at some of these areas, you know, some of the comments and some of the things that we started looking at as part of the, the, the recommendations was, should we be looking at, or is it important for the community to start looking at providing the additional parking for the vehicles over there with the beach ends themselves? Do we need additional bicycle parking? This is a very bike friendly community. Uh, by the way, like Colleen said, I love the bike racks. We've actually showed that off to a number of communities that we work with. Uh, improved ADA accessibility, so being able to go from the beach ends over to the beach itself. Uh, the improvements for the traffic safety and circulation, and you can see the three modes there. Uh, protecting the natural areas, that's a pretty easy one, but it's also a very important one, we think. You know, providing additional shade, and then also looking at lighting and, and kind of keeping with the trends that the city's already initiated, you know, the solar-powered as well as the turtle-friendly lighting. Those are all, you know, that, that the 
because habitat specific items are always a big item. So, you know, as we're kind of going through that, and well, unfortunately we don't have a question on this one, but and we will be identifying a few things here in just a little bit as it relates to some of these beach ends that could improve the ability for the residents and visitors to enjoy the beach and the community without impacting the neighborhood. Now, one of the things I did want to kind of go back on because we didn't give you the option to vote on some of that when Colleen was talking about adding even street trees, you drive around this area and you see those hard corners. What we call that is that, that concrete corner all the way around. There's no parking, no, no, no cars are parked there. It's just a concrete area. Those are kind of those areas that we that we were looking at of could you you know retrofit as you're doing some of your stormwater features with some trees or with some of those uh, rain gardens or something else to improve the look of the intersection versus just having that hard concrete edge all the way along. That's actually pretty cheap uh, when you start looking at some of those uh, prices. So the beach ends we know is a big is a big deal. It's a big area of, of review for us as well. So Mike, if we go to the next one, you know, kind of going back to the stormwater improvements. So we did, and you know, we've been talking with the city, we have been talking with our engineers, we've been looking at some of the, the drainage that we see and the stormwater improvements. And there again, you know, you've got a built out area, so it's a little tough to do sometimes, but the city's taking strides to undertake some of those improvements. Uh, so when we start thinking about stormwater improvements, you know, we're looking at, it's, as Colleen said, retrofitting some of the streets when you're paving to allow some of those biofilters and some of the other things that gets the water down uh, into the ground quicker and out. Uh, start looking at a little bit more at the basin area, that broader area study of what's going on, especially we'll say like Fillmore and some of the other areas. Can we look at uh, some increasing the existing storm sewer pipe capacity by increasing pipe sizes? when we're retrofitting streets. But you know, one of the, core, the key things we also gotta make sure of is whatever size pipe we put in, we gotta make sure we've got the backflows uh, so that you know, the water from the, the, the Banana River or, or any other water body is not coming back up. Uh, we actually have that issue in Sarasota right now where a lot of the storm pipes that are tied to Sarasota Bay allow the, the tidal surge to come all the way up into the downtown area and it creates a little bit of a headache. So, so that plus a king tide plus everything else, yeah, your downtown Sarasota gets a little wet. So that's a simple, easy fix that we're kind of identifying and looking at here. Stormwater improvements don't have to just be pipe sizes and new basins and things like that. You can actually get into some of these features that we've talked about here and identify which are the rain gardens that, that Colleen was identifying. Uh, tree wells, those are actually pretty inexpensive to do as well. Uh, pervious pavers, now that does get into a little bit of maintenance, but uh, it can be done, especially in the coastal community. A lot of coastal communities have the pervious pavers. They also have the maintenance truck to go with it, Todd, as you know, uh, hint, hint, uh, capital improvement list. But, uh, you know, those are the types of things that help get the stormwater that, you know, when it hits the ground into the ground instead of hitting the surface running into the street itself. So some of these, as Zach and, and the city has been looking at, are things that they're already doing. And I, and, and I forgot the name of the park that you have uh, up, up on North Atlantic. The smaller one, Wagner Park, uh, where you already have kind of a test in place right now with some of these types of features. So if you wanna see one in action, go right there. That's a phenomenal little park. Um, mm -hmm. So then we get into, after the stormwater, we do get into the resiliency improvements. Uh, now, resiliency is another one of those great phrases that is, encompasses a lot of stuff, and it's not just one specific item. Uh, you know, it's not just sea level rise. It's not just hardening of the city's infrastructure. It's not just dealing with a couple of things. There's a broad brush approach to a lot of these types of things. And Colleen and I know we've looked at, uh, you know, the city did a resiliency master plan and some studies. We've been looking at a couple of things for coastal communities. And there are some things that we can be looking at to make the community an overall sustainable, resilient community. 
Uh, and actually there's a lot of grants out there for this too. Uh, things such as, you know, planting the, you know, the native plants and trees, uh, you know, kind of looking at what are those trees that are Florida friendly and coastal friendly. Uh, what are the things that we're looking at from a zero scape and those low impact design and development standards that reduce our stormwater impacts and can also reduce our, the heat coming off of the pavement. Uh, we can look at some of our bus stops with looking at those coverings and at the same time looking at the solar powered light like the city has, you can also implement that on the bus shelters as well. So there's a lot of these things that you can kind of see through here. Uh, you know, all the way through to converting 100% of the city streetlights to solar by 2050. A lot of grants for that. A lot of grants. Uh, capturing the stormwater for reuse through stormwater chambers, the rain barrels, and the green roofs. Uh, and then also, you know, start looking at this. Is, this is another topic. At least 25% of the new roads within the city, uh, or parking or sidewalks, should be permeable. So allowing that water to go through. A little bit extra maintenance, but there are things that you can do, especially within a certain setting. So the big question that we always start to ask, and we always get asked at this point is, okay, how much and when? Now I made the joke the last time and it kind of fell flat, but I'm gonna try it again on this group. Um, no, I'm kidding. So, you know, we, we start looking at implementation of those broad-based topics, so those items, and then start to identify what could the city be implementing within what we call a short-term period. That, so between now and the first five years of this plan, what's that midterm, so that five to 10? And then what we consider long-term, some people may go, well, 10 years isn't that long, but, you know, kind of looking out a little bit further. You know, when, when the city updates their comprehensive plan every seven years, they're looking at a capital improvements plan every seven years. Now, I will tell you that the city looks at their capital improvements plan and their schedule every year. They also look at doing updates mid-year depending on available resources or needs for projects. Now, the, the other interesting thing about this is, especially, and, and Todd and, and the rest of the staff can talk to you about this as well, you know, 10 years to some people may seem like an eternity. Some people will say it's too quick, it's too soon. Uh, and this is where I guess the, 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 the dad joke or the bad joke especially. Uh, I, I, I liken government years to dog years. You know, seven years is equal to one. By the time we plan, design, you know, permit and construct it, you're about that five year mark. So that's one of the reasons we start identifying what are those short term fixes? What are that, what's that low hanging fruit that we can implement now? And also start to plan for the future. And more importantly, what can council look at every year as part of their retreat, as part of their budget cycle, as part of this process to say, we like this project for street trees along Fillmore and this, and here's the cost. And they can start picking and choosing based off of those priorities that the community has identified. They can do that on an annual basis. So we wanna make sure we can at least start to identify what are some of those projects that can be done short term and what are some of those costs same thing with the midterm and then of course the long term are probably those improvements that cost a little bit more at the end of the day. So I'm going to ask Colleen to help out with this next question. So we've got a, a couple more poll questions for you before we take a little bio break. Um, first question, now that you've heard about all these broad-based recommendations, what are your top two priorities for short-term implementation within that five-year time frame? So it should open up right now. You have 45 seconds. <laughs> the countdown is up on the screen. I can pretty much say we're gonna extend this one just a little bit. <laughs> so you can pick two on this one. Don't just pick one. Boats are coming in. Looks like stormwater is winning the day. Not a surprise there. There's definitely overlap with some some of the other recommendations too. So. I think this is like watching the Kentucky Derby this past weekend. Oh. That's another one. Who the thought? Not okay. many people would have thought that that horse would win. Especially when it wasn't even in the field the day before. <laughs> Well, um, we're consistent. Stormwater and traffic calming. 
everyone entered their votes. All right. Thank you. Okay, so next one. Yep. All right. Cruise on through. We just want to be respectful of everybody's time. Yeah. Right? We need to do a fire board. So do it. If you, yeah, we're happy to keep going. So top two priorities for midterm implementation for broad-based recommendations. So that five to 10 year time frame. And we're already going. We're down, we're at 34 seconds. So pick your two, pick your two. Don't pick more than two. <laughs> you, this one is you can enter multiples, so I think you can actually pick more than two, but we're taking you on the honor system here. Yeah. Keep in mind, we are going to be asking you about long term on the next one as well. Mm -hmm. You have your chance to vote on what, what we're going to do in 10 years. Bicycle improvements and pedestrian improvements. I don't know what you would call it. I'll be retired in 10 years. I will not be. Like Still have a few more working years left in me. So in 10 years when I come back, I'm just going to park at the beach and just hang out at the beach all day long. <laughs> yeah, that's great. I will be living the plan. All right. Um, so top two priorities now for long-term implementation. For those broad based recommendations, it should be starting in five, four, three, two, one. There we go. 45 seconds. I know, that's why I did it. Resiliency. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, roadway, resurfacing, that kind of thing. Great. I'll be curious Are to go back and look at our short and midterm, especially as it relates to the beach ends. Mm -hmm. Place making. Not a high priority for long term. Right. Well, since we don't need a break, we'll start talking about our recommendation focus areas. So our team, based on the, the feedback we got from the community survey and um, from our last workshop, we, we really honed in on several locations in that focus area. Um, we, because we wanted to drill down. Now, these recommendations can be implemented at other locations. We just picked these because you know this seemed like important to the community at the moment. Um, we looked at three different intersections. We looked at an intersection with Ridgewood Ave, um, Ridgewood and Fillmore. We heard we heard a lot about that intersection, which I'll get into here in a moment. Um, sounds like we have some people very excited about that. Um, we, we also wanted to pick an intersection with North Atlantic Ave, and so um, not far from this place where we are right now, North Atlantic Ave and Tyler Ave. And then an intersection that's more of a residential street intersection, um, Magnolia Ave and Tyler Ave. We heard, we heard a bit about that one too. Um, as far as streets, we took a close look at Fillmore Ave, and we have some different options for you to vote on um, with respect to this one. But we heard so much about um, flooding on Fillmore that we felt it would be good to address multiple improvements from a streetscape perspective, flooding perspective, and kind of take a, a good look at what we can do. And then we took a, a look at Poinsettia because we wanted to look at a north-south street. And um, Poinsettia, we heard a lot about um, concerns about traffic calming and safety. And um, it's a real straight shot, so that's not a big surprise. Here's a closer look at um, at those locations and also um, some of the points of interest 
in the, that study area that we want to make sure we're connecting with and, and accessing. We've got the beach access points, as well as some of these municipal facilities, the um, parks, library, government complex. Next slide, please. So existing conditions for Ridgewood and Fillmore. Um, we see we see some standing water here. Um, you know, workshop survey feedback. People talked about flooding, stinky water, um, a safety concern, narrow sidewalks. There's an unsafe crossing at this location. It's hard to see um, when you're driving across that intersection um, on Fillmore, um, and and wanting to see shade trees there. So we came up with some recommendations. Um, this is a all of the above, or we can pick and choose from these. Um, so potential for a raised intersection, like what Kelly was talking about, it's basically use, taking that whole intersection and turning it into a big speed hump. Um, it raises the pedestrians up so that they can be well seen um, and you know slows slows traffic down a bit. You could couple that with some mural art um, and and make something really fun. Um, you know, making sure ADA accessible crosswalks exist there, kind of bringing the curbs out a bit more um, for reducing that pedestrian um, crossing area and also improving vehicle sight distance, looking at rain gardens, bioswales, et cetera, um, solar lighting. Yeah. yeah. One of the projects that actually Colleen is running up right now is with the city of Lakeland. And they're mm -hmm. actually partnering with the Department of Transportation on the mural art. And one of the things that they were doing was not just doing any art, but having the competition. Uh, so it engaged the people of that portion of the city to come up with a design that could then be implemented. And what's the construction of the design schedule for that one? Um, well, first we have to get it permitted through DOT, but hoping to implement it later this year. There's grants for this too. Um, making sure that whenever we're doing one of these big improvements, we're upsizing all the stormwater pipes so that we can, you know, if we're tearing up the intersection, let's fix everything underneath it too. And we'll save some money that way because that stuff is expensive to do and come back in and, and fix what you've done before. So um, at that, this point, we're gonna do another little poll. So what are your top two priorities for short-term implementation um, for an intersection like this. It looks like for some reason. There's only yeah. one question on this one. Don't worry, you don't have to think about mid or long term. Yeah, just short term. Has we started yet, Mike? It's not working? Hmm. Oh, I think it might have been the, the way we populated this one. We did like a duplicate. All right, well, let's skip over that. Sorry. We can also... We're going to blame Mike on this one. <laughs> Poor Mike. <laughs> um, I want to make sure we can gather feedback on that one. So we'll follow up with um, SurveyMonkey. Uh, next intersection, looking at North Atlantic and Tyler Ave. So here, the existing conditions, we had a pedestrian safety um, concern there. There was a crash or a couple of crashes. Um, we've got a bus stop there. We're looking at connectivity with uh, City Hall. We got a lot of feedback on this location at the workshop, looking, wanting to see shade trees, that there's a point of interest. Um, unsafe crossings, unsafe speeding vehicles. I think this is probably people coming off of um, A1A North Atlantic and turning into the neighborhood. Um, narrow sidewalks, um, some, some concerns about landscaping. You see that tension there between wanting to see more landscaping and too much landscaping. So it's a fine line. Um, and then creating more protective crossings. So what are our recommendations? Um, Next slide. Let's start talking about them. So next, um, recommendations, looking at widening that sidewalk to a multi-use path. 
to make sure that um, people can travel safely on multiple modes of transportation. Looking at some of those artistic crosswalks, adding in green infrastructure, shade trees and other landscaping as long as it's not um, blocking sight distances, looking at that solar lighting for the bus shelter, pedestrian lighting, and then also you know, working with FDOT on providing connectivity because you have a bus stop on the other side of A1A. Um, sometimes you're not coming from that side of the street. You're coming from the other, the other direction and you wanna get across into presidential streets. So making sure that connectivity is safe and smooth across North Atlantic. So we got a poll for this one too. Hopefully this one works. Fingers crossed. Yes, all right. So tense in a few seconds. Of the options for this type of an intersection, what are your top two for short-term implementation from all the things that I just mentioned? You should be able to vote now. Is it working, everybody? Okay, great. Something weird, weird about that one. should be two. You can pick more than one here. Great, we have painted crosswalks. I love watching the numbers kind of adjust mm -hmm. when people are voting. Time's up. Thank you everyone for getting your votes in. The, the last intersection we're gonna talk about today is the intersection of Magnolia and Tyler. Um, you notice this needs resurfacing. We've got storm drains at each corner of the intersection, um, which is gonna limit what you, what you can do here, um, but certainly that can be adjusted if we're doing a lot um, of improvements lack of sidewalk connectivity. And then from the workshop, we heard safety concerns, flooding, um, you know, wanting to see more consistent stop signs and uh, more about sidewalk connectivity and lighting and then sight distance. So as far as recommendations for this intersection, um, looking at that possibility for a raised intersection, which would improve pedestrian safety um, and also improve that sidewalk connectivity looking at mural and art, um, making sure those crosswalks are ADA accessible and those curb ramps get updated, bringing the curbs out a bit um, to you know, help reduce pedestrian crossing distance, but also provide some of that traffic calming effect. Um, certainly improving stormwater infrastructure and permeability um, with whatever we do in that um, intersection, upsizing the stormwater pipes and or you know adding in some of those um, green infrastructure improvements, and then adding in pedestrian scale lighting. So another poll. Of the options for this intersection, what are your top two for short-term implementation? And you should start now. It's the old one. All right. Rats. Well, if some of them can still apply. So if you see <laughs> ones that overlap, which there might be, um, and I, I know that there are other than the bus shelter um, or crossing North Atlantic, please feel free to vote on those. Sorry about that. We're testing out a new interactive polling software today. So you guys are the guinea pigs and thank you for that. Oh, oh go back, Mike. Oh, okay. We'll make sure Mike. Oh, okay. I think Good. what else I have oh, that part. Okay. While she's doing that, um, 
just a general question. You know, who has lived here more than five years? More than 10? 15? 20? 25? 96? I love it. How long have you been here? 25? That says a lot. Um, Colleen and I were joking where I live. We can tell who are the newbies because where I live, I literally live right across the street from a Publix. Two miles down the road is another Publix that was formerly in Albertsons. And it's like, so when you moved here, how many Publix were there? And the, the, the person who's lived there more than 10 years will say, oh, it was an Albertsons. Anybody else says, oh yeah, there's two Publixes. It's like, oh yeah, you're the new one. <laughs> So Colleen, what are we asking them to do on these index cards? Yeah, Mike, can you get back to that slide? So for those of you who are, can't hear Colleen because I forgot to give her the microphone, so, uh, sorry, we can't do get you involved in this one, so we're gonna keep it at this point. We will get with city staff uh, to get some of these questions back out via survey month, or some other things, and expand out the poll for a little bit. Are you gonna give them 30 seconds to write? Right, quickly. <laughs> Counting down. Magnolia and Tyler Ave. And for those of you tuning in online, we will make sure your answers are recorded in the Survey Monkey. And I'll come around and collect at the end. Thank you all for your patience. Raised intersection, mural art, ADA accessible crosswalks, bulb outs, stormwater infrastructure, permeability, and pedestrian lighting. And if there's something on here that you want to see, now is your chance you can actually write it in because you don't have to respond to just the multiple choice. <laughs> Another 10 Okay, Mike, if you can go ahead and go on to Fillmore. So, you know, Fillmore is one of those that, you know, early on in the process, we were talking to city staff, we were talking to residents, and Fillmore kept coming up as far as one of those areas that we really needed to focus in on from a stormwater perspective, from a flooding perspective, from a connectivity perspective. And, you know, the one thing, interesting thing about it is, especially when you look at the location of Fillmore within the presidential street, it is, I mean, kind of like Polk, it's one of those central spines that goes east-west. There's a lot of activity going on in connectivity. So we started looking at a few things and, you know, everybody is kind of, you know, I dare say you've probably seen this exact same scene right here. But, you know, when we started looking at this, especially along the entire length of Fillmore, we started noticing that there is a limited amount of what we call right-of-way. So how much room that the city has to work within that the city technically owns. It's only 45 feet. By contrast, some of the other areas within the city are 50 and upwards of 60. Most of your newer developments today, if you were developing something like this, would be a minimum of 50 feet wide. And of course, we would have taken care of the stormwater and some of the other stuff at the same time. But so we've got a smaller area to work within. Uh, this is one of the hot spots for flooding, especially when it's between Orange and Magnolia. You can see this here, and I know some, some have told us this goes down pretty quickly. Others have said, eh, it's there for a little bit longer. So there again, kind of going back to that perception is reality. Uh, you know, if it's standing there and it's a nuisance to you, it's a problem. 
uh, connectivity with the recreation complex, which is a, a very critical facility for the city. You know, some of the existing conditions, other things we were talking about were safety concerns at the intersection with Poinsettia. And we'll talk about that a little bit more, kind of like what with, with what Colleen was identifying. And then also the beach ends, you know, the limited space and the unlimited amount of parking that's on that beach end. So what we got back from the initial survey and the workshop was that there's no stairs. Uh, this, it's only the beach access ramps. Uh, there's, you know, from the beach side, there's flooding and the awful smell. Uh, flooding, you all know what the issues are, please fix. Uh, that one was excellent, I like that one. Uh, stinky water, I'm not sure where stinky water keeps coming up from, but uh, pool lighting, need more shade trees, a lack of sidewalks, uh, speeding vehicles, uh, creating a bike lane or a pathway, and also those unsafe crossings. So we took a look at a couple of different options that the city could identify. Now we're not saying that this is going to be applied citywide, but there are certain locations where this could work especially when we have a limited amount of right of way. So we said, okay, right now you could, you know, right now it's two way traffic. So there's direct cars going east, there's cars going west. And you can continue to maintain that, but there's also areas that you can improve, uh, not only just the look and the feel, but also the function of Fillmore. You know, we could create, like it says here, some of those uh, bicycle sharing the roadway, those share roads that Colleen talked about and making it more of a visible identification that People are more cognizant that, yeah, we're sharing the road with a bike. Uh, the pavement lighting for some of the crosswalks, uh, six foot sidewalk on both sides, uh, connecting all the way down to the beach. And believe it or not, even with those cars that back out directly onto Fillmore, there's a way to make that work. And we, we've identified a couple of ways to do that. Did we lose connectivity, Mike? Nope. We'll make these available at the end. You zoom in? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we'll make sure that, the, that uh, the city has this. So it'll be on the city's website under this portion of the project. Uh, so we, we will make this available to anybody uh, to, to look at online. Uh, you know, some of the other things that we looked at, even with the current condition, is an additional pe a beach parking with some perme permeable pavement, and also creating some additional bicycle uh, parking at the ends. Now, what does that kind of look like if you were standing in the middle of the street uh, looking to the east or to the west? Um, oh, Got to wait for Mike. Hey, Mike. Thank you. Uh, so what could that look like within that, that uh, right of way? You can still have the, the travel lanes. Those are 10 feet wide, which is the minimum that we typically uh, recommend. You could have some on street parking or bike lanes, and there's still a little bit of room to be able to do the curb and gutter and also some street trees. Now it does get a little tight. And we also know that there's some conflicts when we're looking along Fillmore, especially where we have those condo units that back directly out onto Fillmore itself. There again, there's ways to design and implement some things, maybe not along the entire length, but within the city's right of way that can incorporate all or portions of this. There are a couple of other things that you could be looking at from a, you know, a partnership with those uh, the condo units and those buildings to help redesign maybe some of the parking that allows the city some additional room to, to make some improvements. All of that's one of those realm of possibilities. So what is another option that we could identify in this location? What if we made Fillmore one way? Now, if we make Fillmore one way, we know we gotta make something else the other direction. Uh, but you know, you could, within that area, convert that to one-way traffic, whether it's eastbound or westbound. Uh, you still have your drive aisle. You still have, in this case, you're providing the, uh, you know, a, a bicycle boulevard. So those dedicated bike lanes. Uh, we can definitely do the intersection improvements with the sidewalks. It gives us a lot more room to look at some on-street rain gardens and street trees. Uh, it also, there again, when we get down into it, there's room once you get on the east side of, of, of Ridgewood 
to do some improvements along Fillmore and create some additional on street parking options. It looks a little tight, but when you measure it out and you start to kind of look at some of the engineering, you can get either what we call, you know, the parallel parking. So those parking spaces that you can pull in and kind of back into, or there's actually enough room to do some angle parking there as well. Uh, it get, does get a little tight, and that is one of those traffic calming measures we all talk about. Uh, and I thought we don't have the actual a blow up of that one, do we, at the beach end? So in the final report, uh, we've got the, a, a blow up that kind of shows how that could function. So there again, just know that there, we, we've looked at that, uh, and there is a way to get some additional parking on the beach end within the city's right of way, and at the same time create some shade areas, some pedestrian improvements, some additional areas for bicycles, and also to start looking at some of those turnarounds as well. Oh, oh, sorry, my bad. You got ahead of them. Oh, I did get ahead. They'll be excited. This is like seeing Star Wars Episode Four before you see our Star Wars Episode One. I just let the cat out of the bag on a couple of things with Darth Vader and Luke. But anyway, you missed it. Okay. So, uh, what would a one-way street look like in this case? You would actually have uh, areas and uh, improved areas for bicycle uh, connectivity. You'd have those areas for you know pedestrians and those along the sidewalks, areas for street trees. You could actually work in a chicane at this point. So you can increase uh, some of your st uh, stormwater improvements, those rain gardens, as well as some of your other enhancements along the way. So there's a lot of flexibility that you create by doing this. But there again, if you do one one way, you gotta do something else the other way. But what we're not advocating as part of this is that you start at Washington and work your way down and do every other one going east and every other one going west. To the contrary, we're saying, you know, if you want to look at that, look at a couple of core uh, transportation areas that can function as in a one-way fashion without disrupting the traffic flow for the entire neighborhood itself. So, poll question time. This is a real easy one. Yes, Todd. Correct, yeah, Mike, can we go back to that previous slide just for a second, please? So yeah, that if you see the, what looks like uh, the windows underneath the tree, those are those areas where the tree wells are, that's where you could do some uh, rain gardens, that's where you start improving and enhancing some of your stormwater flows within that area. And also, and this is a very key component, also is a water quality. So it's cleaning the water before it ever gets into the Banana River and some of these other areas. So this is not only you know, reducing and, and improving the flooding situation, it's also improving the water quality going into you know, that valuable resource that we have, which is the Banana River. Uh, so all of this as you're repaving and redesigning a street can all be done at one time. Absolutely, great point, Todd. Okay, now we're gonna go to, do you want one way or two way? This is like going to the eye doctor, which is it better, one or two? Is it working? Now it's perfect. Oh, come on. I would have lost money on that one, Todd. <laughs> <laughs> that is, that's actually very interesting. Uh, so, or, or is, is the timer up, Mike? Okay. So, since I've already kind of previewed the beach end discussion, um, let's go talk about the beach ends for a moment. So, uh, there again, you know, now you can actually visualize what I was talking about with. The, you know, that area where the uh, kind of close to where it says beach access is an improvement that you could look at for a turnaround. 
uh, but you'd need to work with the adjacent property owner on that, maybe to maybe swap some area with them. But you know, the parking that you see there uh, on this right there is basically what you have there now along Fillmore. What we're saying is in between that first block coming off of Ridgewood to the, that next driveway, kind of mid area, there's room to do angle parking. There's also room to do parallel parking. And you can see from this graphic, you can even en enhance the sidewalk. You can create some areas that are, uh, there again, some rain gardens with some tree wells in it. And in this situation, you can actually get anywhere between six to eight, almost, you know, depending on the length of it, upwards of 10 additional parking spaces. Now, it does get a little tight because we are showing some sidewalk enhancements, but there again, it's not about the vehicle at this point, it's about the pedestrian, it's about the bicyclist. So let's slow the cars down a little bit. So you could almost, in essence, in, you know, improve the amount of parking at the beach ends by 30 to 40% by looking at some of these options. So, you know, part of this is, like we talked about, uh, you know, you may need to do some land uh, acquisition or a, a swap with some of the adjacent property owners so that you're not getting into the mangroves, of course. But start looking at sidewalk enhancements so that the residents living on the, you know, the west side of Ridgewood have, they feel safe to be able to go across to the beach. Uh, the, add that mid-block crossing so that we can get you from point A to point B with a little bit of a jog uh, but then also enhancing the bicycle parking. A couple of times that we've been here, even during the week, we see that those are full, which is a great, which is a great sign. Uh, there again, looking at additional uh, vehicle parking, and you could also at this point start to look at some of those permeable pavement and the pavers under the parking areas themselves. So that is one of the potential options that you have there. Uh, as you are looking at there again, this isn't just limited to, to Fillmore. This is this could actually be done on any, almost, almost all of the 16 beach ends that you have. So part, part of the problem or challenge that we're seeing is there's a lot of people parking illegally uh, in the neighborhood itself. So we were saying we can get the best of both worlds here. We can do bicycle and sidewalks and enhance some parking at the same time. Um, It's a very good question too, because um, you know it, it does seem counterintuitive, but adding more cars parked, one, it provides some traffic calming too, because you're tightening up that space that cars have to drive faster, and so they, they have to slow down, which provides a safer space for um, bicyclists and pedestrians. The other thing parked cars do is they provide a physical barrier between the roadway and the sidewalk. And so it's like that big metal barrier that you have as um, your protection if you're traveling on the sidewalk too. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's see.
can almost take you down. Um, and so it's been a tough problem because the street is so narrow, they can't turn around, and you have people from the region to park in the place. Because there's no parking there. And it's very unhealthy because they're all parking in the place. Yeah, so part, part of what you were talking about, we're trying to address here. Some of it, of course, we can't. Uh, um, th this this gentleman here, yeah. Uh, but you know, the other thing is, you know, if you know what you were just talking about with the the vehicles kind of speeding through, if we do some of these improvements, whether or not, it, even if it's just the sidewalk and the raised crosswalk, that'll start to slow the cars down, and you know, enhance signage. Uh, at before you even make the turns uh, to help kind of with that public information aspect of what's going on at the beach end will do a lot. Now, what you're talking about with the transient, that's another topic that, yeah, but it's a great comment though. Mike, let's go ahead and hop to the next. Actually, look at you. It looks like my slide got a little messed up. I think I might have been using a different version of PowerPoint than we had. Um, here on this computer. But um, the, I'm going to talk about Poinsetta, another street with limited right of way, 45 to 48 feet, where Poinsetta needs some resurfacing. Um, we have pedestrian crashes located at some of the different intersections. It's important, um, death, it's an important corridor to connect with the recreational complex and Memorial Park. I put my glasses on for this one. Sorry. The, print is so tiny. Um, the workshop and survey feedback, we heard about safety concerns, flooding, shade trees, wanting to see more shade trees at certain locations, um, you know, wanting to see stormwater improvements, traffic calming like speed bumps and stop signs, um, unsafe, unsafe speeding vehicles, traffic calming, lack of sidewalks, and, and poor lighting. So we came up with some recommendations. Um, oh, oh, we got, let's, let's do our poll for the beach end real quick. <laughs> uh, might as well. Yeah, sorry. Something got moved around. Um, we did have a question about the beach end. I was wondering why that one didn't pop up. So what are your top two priorities for short-term implementation among the options listed here? And it should have started already, so you should have a chance to start entering. Yeah, ADA accessibility and wider sidewalks. I think that's over. All right, thank you for your participation in that. So let's go back to Poinsettia. <laughs> um, our recommendations. Many of these relate to traffic calming. So looking at chicanes and pinch points, narrowing the, the roadway down even more. Um, but poinsettia is really a straight shot. And so this could kind of help give it a little bit more wiggle, um, which when you can't see straight shot, you tend to drive a little bit slower. It's a psychological thing. Um, looking at some painted intersections and crosswalks at those locations where we notice we have um, safety concerns. Adding in wider sidewalks, putting in those shared lane markings for bicyclists, um, looking at raised intersections potentially where um, where we had those safety concerns and then also um, look at doing that study on stop sign placement and we have four-way stops we have two-way stops kind of making sure that we're consistent throughout especially now that I hear there's a lot of interest in doing one-way streets we'll definitely have to look at um, stop sign placement in conjunction with uh, any changes like one-way streets in that the study area. So now we should have a poll for Poinsettia. Here we go. So of the options for Poinsettia Avenue, what are your top two for short-term implementation? Twenty-four seconds left, and the results are coming in. Oh yeah, looking at chicanes, 
stop signs. Yeah, I'm not surprised that about that one. Yeah, very good. That's good feedback. All right. Well, that concludes the um, detailed recommendation portion. And so I'm going to turn it back over to Kelly to talk a little bit more about implementation. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. On that option for lighting. Okay. Well, then we'll take that feedback in and, and include that. Yeah. Big picture. Yes. Um, Yeah, especially with major improvements like chicaning, you want to do everything at the same time. Stormwater. Yeah, and that's also one of those broader topics that we talked about earlier with safety, the safety at the intersections, as well as you know the recommendation for the city to go uh, to that higher level of solar lighting. Uh, so I think that that is just exactly what Brenda said is we're retrofitting and looking at some of these improvements that's always taken into consideration. So we, we've talked a lot about what we like, what we don't like, what we'd like to see and when. So where the rubber meets the road, how are we paying for it? So we talked we've, we've said a couple of times that there's a lot of grants out there. The city had the uh, the you know the, the thoughts early on about give us a good plan, give us something we can implement, but also tell us how we can pay for some of this. So as part of our task in this study, is to not, not only identify what are the grant opportunities that are that are out there, but also assist the city on pursuing a grant at the end of this project. So as the city city council is saying, we like this project. City comes back and we work with them, and we've got actually we've got three grants coordinators working in Florida right now. Uh, one of my dear friends, Allison McGrath, who sits in our Gainesville office, uh, her whole job, along with uh, Laura Wittenbauer, who sits right in between uh, Colleen and I, and then another young lady that sits in Fort Myers, their whole job is to do nothing but find grants for communities. Allison has been so successful that she's uh, actually won, was it 42 million, I think, for the city of Hollywood over the last year. Um, so she's got a pretty good hit record. Um, so part of the thing that we did was just at this point, we'll start to identify what are those grant options and opportunities that are out there that we can help to you know, partner with the city on. Talking with Zach, talking with Todd, talking with you know, the city staff about what's the most important project and how do we go about funding it using this as a plan to, to make it happen. Because here's one of the things I will tell you from a planning and development perspective. You go after a grant, first thing they're gonna say is, is it in a plan? If it's not, you don't make it out of the starting gate, literally, I'm going back to the Kentucky Derby. Uh, if it is in a plan, great. What kind of support do we have? Well, we could actually look at this plan that we're proposing and it's a short-term goal. It's a high priority of the city council we've identified this, this, and this as our matching funding sources. Those things add up very quickly. And you go from being out of the race to winning at that point, several, several projects. And you know, one, pro one successful project starts to kind of steamroll to other projects because one of the things that you're doing at that point is you're proving to the folks that you're talking to on some of these grants that you're committed to these programs. And this is a short term, this is a phased approach. This is something that we value as a community, not just a council, not just as a city manager, but as a community. 
those types of things and those testimonials go a long way in identifying what we can do and how we do it. So there again, we've actually just included a, a, a couple of snippets here. How many pages did we actually have? Various types of improvements, and that's just the short list. Uh, but all of those grants are uh, available to this community for these types of projects. So there again, we're trying to identify some of those additional funding sources as we go through. So next, Mike. Uh, so that kind of tells, I mean, just kind of the implementation component. So it's not just going to be city funds. It's not going to just be state funds. It's not going to be grants. It's not going to just be CRA. There's a lot of different buckets that we're going to be working in. If you were here with us at the initial workshop, we gave you uh, Canaveral bucks and said, put them in a bucket. It's the same type of thing here. So when we're identifying these projects and identifying some of these designs, there are multiple things that we're going to be pursuing to help pay for these projects so that it's not just a burden on a single singular group, but there, there are dollars that are out there specifically for communities like Cape Canaveral for these types of projects and for these types of situations. Resiliency grants are huge right now. If we're talking about making the city of Cape Canaveral more resilient, whether it's addressing sea level rise, addressing uh, you know, low impact development, even doing things as simple as, as a test site for a rain garden. The, you know, the, the water management districts love those kinds of things, especially in these, in these environments. So there again, we're looking at that from an overall perspective, from an implementation standpoint. And with that, we are actually at the end of our presentation. Uh, there again, like I said earlier, this is not the last time that you're going to see us. You're going to see us at least two, if not three more times. Uh, we'll be providing some additional information both on the city's website and as well as the formal report. Uh, we will be working with city staff to actually get the survey monkey out on to, to the broader group as far as these questions or concerns, but we are going to take comments we received here tonight very seriously, um, especially because there's a couple of really, really good polls at the end, at the end of the day. Uh, if you do have your comment card that Colleen asked you to fill that out, hold those up high. She's going to come through and collect them. Uh, there we go. Any additional comments or thoughts that you want to provide us? Uh, there is, uh, at this point, we can still contact Brenda. Uh, that's going to switch over uh, shortly to Zach. Zach is in the back. Uh, however, you can always reach out to the city uh, and just ask, tell them that you have a comment regarding presidential streets and they will make sure to get you to the correct person and also we'll be able to record your comments at that point. Brenda, any thoughts? Yeah. And I just wanna make everyone um, know that I will make sure that the presentation does go on the city's website and it will very likely be a, kind of a recap in the weekly update. If you're not signed up for that, make sure you do because it gives you a lot of good information about things happening in the city. Um, and then just generally keep an open mind and remember that this is a long process. Um, this is only the beginning. And um, when we look at budgeting for the city and ways to pay for this, grants are an option, but also consider that this will be, you know, investing in the city uh, long term. So just be patient with us and keep an open mind. If you guys have any other questions, also, you can contact me or Zach. Thank you. Thank you all.